Hi, this is Jim Walden in for Harry Littman. In the Trump world, it is easy to miss the forest for the trees. There's so much bad news for the former president on which you could focus. And if you just take the last 72 hours, you'll see what I mean. Mark Meadows, his former chief of staff and Trump loyalist, uh, now added to the witness list in the election interference case, having testified that President Trump knew full well that he lost the election. His former consigliere, Michael Cohen, testifying in state Supreme Court about Trump cooking the books to try to inflate his own uh, net worth. Uh, Justice Aragon in the same suit, fining Trump $10,000 for violating the gag order again. The new parade of witnesses in the Georgia election interference case, which includes three core members of Trump's legal team, prepared to say that they knew the whole thing was a lie and a farce. And that doesn't even include the bad news that Trump makes for himself, like his recent comparison of his situation to that of Nelson Mandela, apartheid activist who spent 27 years in jail, oftentimes in solitary confinement. But none of this news seems to impact Trump's base. Uh, he has a core uh, group of supporters, and all the bad news does is seem to swell his numbers, particularly his campaign finance numbers. But there are a series of cases that have the potential for real political consequences. These cases are pending in federal courts across the nation, and particularly in the battleground states of Colorado, Michigan, and Minnesota. And each of these cases raises a fascinating legal question that is underexplored. And that is, is President Trump disqualified from holding office under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution? And who gets to decide that? Now, let's just start with some basic principles. Section 3 of uh, the 14th Amendment was ratified by the states in 1868 after the Civil War. And it says, in pertinent part, that no person shall hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, who, having previously taken an oath as an officer of the United States to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies of the United States. Now, obviously, I'm asking this question about whether Section 3 applies in the context of the January 6th insurrection or demonstration, depending on your political leanings. I think the facts of what happened that day are beyond public debate at this point. But just to recap, a large group of people illegally trespassed on federal property. They were resisting the execution of constitutional and legal processes for declaring Joe Biden the winner of the 2020 election. This is the so-called certification of the election. They broke into the Capitol, believing the presidential election was stolen. They were violent and forceful and attacked police officers, committed other acts of vandalism on the Capitol grounds. Many of them threatened to hang then Vice President Mike Pence who Trump had just publicly assailed for not blocking the certification of the election. And this was all based on a fraudulent slate of electors scheme that was underway in Georgia and other battleground states to replace real electors with fake slates of electors. And this mob that broke into the Capitol was clearly acting at President Trump's direction. In fact, the House panel investigating January 6th called President Trump, quote, the central cause of the insurrection. In fact, we now know that it was only because of the Secret Service that President Trump didn't go to the Capitol himself to join the rioters. Secret Service stopped that. But even after January 6th, President Trump has continued to give support to the insurrectionists, hailing them as heroes and stating his intent to pardon them if he's ever put back in office. So let's talk about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and see whether or not that will be a problem for President Trump in any of the states where these suits are pending. Now, it's important to note that the scholarship behind this argument is largely the scholarship of conservative legal scholars, uh, many of them law professors or former law professors who have studied it in detail, the provision that is, and studied it from the perspective of the originalist point of view, not meaning what do the words mean now, but what did they mean to the largely men 
that drafted these words prior to the 1868 election. And while there's some debate, the scholars agree that in looking at the original intent, you have to look at the language and the sources from which they drew the words that they used on the page when drafting Section 3 and ultimately when the states ratified uh, Section 3. And so they're looking at what the drafters intended back in the late 1860s. And then the word insurrection was considered very broadly because it was tied, according to the legal scholars, to the framers of Section 3's understanding of the word treason in Article 3 of the Constitution. And the act of treason was a very broad act. And it included anyone who, quote, embraces any combination to prevent or oppose by force the execution of a provision of either the Constitution of the United States or any public statute of the United States. Now, we're going to get into this in a little while, but those originalists may be regretting the consequences of the originalist point of view, because when you look back at the scholarship, it is fairly clear and there's very little debate over the fact that Article 3 provides the pathway to the language of Section 3 and Article 3 was really focused on treason very broadly, including any organized act to prevent, for example, Congress from doing its job. So that's pretty broad. In addition, uh, there are two important things that were added to Section 3, one of which is in Article 3, which includes giving aid or comfort to enemies of the United States, including insurrectionists. And the second was at the very late stages of Section 3's drafting, a group of senators wanted to include a provision that limited the provision to past acts of insurrection. So Section 3 would have only been backward looking, not forward looking. And importantly, when Section 3 was ultimately passed and then ratified, that limitation was removed. So the scholars agree that not only does the provision apply to instances of insurrection before the passage of Section 3, i.e. the Civil War, but also future events uh, that raise similar issues. But it's important to understand this is not a one-sided debate, and it's not one-sided in part because there's so few cases that actually try to interpret uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. There's virtually no precedent, and whatever precedent exists is recent and mixed. There are some political points that are made in this context where the opponents of the application of Section 3 say that it would be a political miscalculation for state courts to remove Donald Trump from the ballot knowing that he is widely popular and that these individuals who support him would see it as another form of election interference. But there are some more technical legal points. And the main one that is raised is, does Section 3 stand on its own? Is it self-executing or is it essentially constitutional guidance that just sits there in limbo until Congress actually passes a law to implement it? Most legal scholars say that it is self-executing, but these legal scholars don't get to decide the issue at the end of the day. It's going to end up in state courts, and that's where it sits now. So let's talk for a second about the current state of play. There are a number of cases that have decided this specific issue. So, for example, a state court in September of this year disqualified a January 6th participant from sitting as a county official under Amendment 14, Section 3. And that court's decision is an important precedent because the court made two foundational uh, holdings that might reappear in some future litigation. First, the judge held that in order to be removed under Section 3, you don't need to have been convicted of a crime first. Congress only required, and the Constitution therefore only required, that the person participate in an insurrection. And secondly, and importantly in that case, and maybe importantly for President Trump, the court held that you don't need to personally engage in violence as long as you participated knowingly in a scheme to obstruct a government process or decision. 
So just this month, a Colorado state judge issued an important decision in another one of these cases. Uh, they're a very well-heeled group with a lot of uh, money to bring lawsuits, as they have all over the country, filed a claim trying to disqualify President Trump from Colorado's ballot. President Trump's legal team filed a motion to dismiss, and the state judge in that case rejected it, saying that the petitioners in that case stated a viable legal theory and is going to allow the case to go to trial later this year. But not all the cases have been winners. Uh, a Florida case was brought by an individual voter. And in that case, in a very narrow ruling, without opining on whether or not the state courts had the power to disqualify President Trump from the ballot in Florida, that state judge narrowly held that the individual who filed that lawsuit did not have standing because he was not running for the office himself. So you would think, given all that we've heard about state secretaries of state, the people at the state level that actually control election processes and the ballot, we'd be hearing more from uh, these secretaries of state. But so far, they've remained on the sidelines as these private lawsuits are filtering through the system. Um, so where does that leave us now? As we look forward to more cases where the issue ultimately gets resolved, we're going to have trials. And those trials may actually occur before some of the other trials that we're all fully familiar with in Georgia and at the federal level that charge President Trump criminally. And some of the factual issues there will be fascinating and may bear on whether Section 3 gets applied. So we'll learn, for example, whether there's evidence that President Trump knew the mob planned to infiltrate the Capitol while he was giving his speech at the Olympus. We will maybe learn whether there's evidence that he knew specifically that their plan was to block the certification. And part of his speech was indeed criticizing Vice President Trump for failing to intervene to stop the certification. We may learn, for example, why two of the groups who were central to the insurrection, and in fact, the point of the spear in breaching the Capitol, and by that I mean the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, were actually serving as the security detail for two of uh, Trump's most loyal and regular uh, consultants, Steve Bannon and Roger Stone, as January 6th was unfolding. And we may learn that what was in Trump's mind when he decided and he told the Secret Service that he actually wanted to go to the Capitol on January 6th to join the rioters? Was he planning to try to stop them because he didn't for hours and hours thereafter? Or was he planning something else? And we may learn from a legal perspective whether or not even after January 6th, Trump's promise to pardon the insurrectionists is enough to apply Section 3, or whether a court determines that that is protected speech that can't be considered in the context of a Section 3 application. We may also start to see some of these answers in some of the pending criminal cases, but it's hard to know. There are some important political questions that need to get answered in this context, though, and that's where would a disqualification lead us? Would it lead us to more acrimony? Would it lead us to more civil unrest? We don't know the answer to those questions, but we do know that the Supreme Court is ultimately going to decide this issue. And in trying to game theory what the Supreme Court is going to say, it's important to note for the past 30 years, the state has, the Supreme Court rather, has been increasingly leaning into states' rights. So even before Trump's three recent appointees joined the court, the court was already saying that states' rights including the right over elections, even federal elections, was an important point that the Constitution enshrines. And that obviously we saw the results of that in 2000 when the Supreme Court left the 2000 election up to the state of Florida that ultimately decided for President Bush and against then candidate Al Gore. But even since that time, especially with the ascent of the Trumpers on the Supreme Court, the court has been leaning more into states' rights, even in the election context. I mean, 10 years ago, the independent state legislature theory, once a fringe theory that says that even state courts can't overturn 
um, unconstitutional decisions by the state legislatures themselves has now gained three Supreme Court votes in a case called Moore versus Harper decided two terms ago. And even before Moore, one of Trump's appointees tipped his hand on the specific issues related to Section 3. And that's Neil Gorsuch, because before Gorsuch was on the Supreme Court, he wrote an opinion in 2012, and I'm paraphrasing here, the states have the legal authority to exclude from the ballot candidates who are constitutionally prohibited from assuming the office. That's one vote that very well may be backing a Section 3 challenge to President Trump. And so this originalist bent on the Supreme Court may very well be a matter of be careful what you wish for. Hey everyone, Harry here. Hope you're enjoying the content from all the friends of our channel, great experts in their fields all. I want to thank them for stepping up to the plate while I'm away. I'll be back soon and I'm looking forward to resuming the daily videos. Talk to you later.